this computer. We always share these recordings on our YouTube channel at Gateway. So uh, welcome to the Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health 30th virtual lecture. This is season four, episode five. My name is Jay McFarlane. I am a board member and research chair at Gateway. And before we start, I would like to acknowledge the land that we reside on. Uh, the Gateway office located in Godric stands on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples, and is connected with the dish with one spoon wampum, under which multiple nations agreed to care for the land and its resources by the Great Lakes in peace. We accept responsibility as treaty people to renew relationships with First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people through reconciliation, community service, and respect. Gateway is a rural health research organization, and our mission is to improve the health and well-being of rural residents through research, education, and communication, like we're doing today. We are, to our knowledge, the only rural health research center in Canada that is governed by a community-based uh, volunteer board of directors. Our topic for today is addressing substance use in rural and primary care. Our lecturer for today is Dr. Michael Beasley, professor at the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy and a recently appointed research chair at Gateway, uh, the research chair of rural substance use. He is a molecular pharmacologist by training and his clinical research has focused on the role of health professionals in reducing harms associated with problematic substance use. Joining us as panelists today, today uh, Ashley Sid, a PhD candidate at Waterloo School of Pharmacy, and Akila uh, Agtarap, a hospital pharmacy resident in Ottawa. So throughout the presentation today, as an attendee, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in that question and answer box in Zoom. And uh, we invite everyone to interact that way. Uh, if you see a question that pop up in the Q&A that you want answered, you can hit the upvote button. You can like that. And that lets the, our, our expert panelists here know that's a question the audience really wants answered. So I encourage everyone to do that. And as a brief disclaimer before we start, I will say the views expressed in this lecture may not necessarily reflect Gateway, uh, the views and opinions, but we believe in providing the platform for a range of perspectives and thoughtful discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Beasley, to uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Jay. I'm going to uh, to share my screen and, and show you some slides, and hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, is talk about three areas related to substance use with a focus on primary and community care. Uh, as Jay said, I'm, I'm a pharmacist by training uh, from Saskatchewan, um, but uh, instead of practicing pharmacy, I went to uh, on the research side of things and did pharmacology research. And I've been with the School of Pharmacy at Waterloo for about 15 years or so. And while in Waterloo region, I'm currently a Goderich resident, but prior to that, a Kitchener resident where I was involved with the Waterloo region uh, integrated drug strategy. And my focus uh, in education and research is really how we deal with substance use, problematic or not, outside of sort of addiction treatment center. So, so folks in those settings really know all the ins and outs, but what happens when you're a sort of more of a general practitioner or service provider, like a community pharmacist, pharmacist or a family physician, social worker or, or nurse, uh, where it's addiction is not necessarily your primary focus, but it certainly comes up with when you're working with diverse populations. I'm joined today, as Jay said, by Ashley Sid and Kyla Egterap, both are uh, graduates of the School of Pharmacy um, at the University of Waterloo. I'm currently co-supervising Ashley as she finishes her PhD uh, at the School of Pharmacy, and Kyla is joining us from Ottawa, where she is uh, currently completing a pharmacy residency. Both Ashley and Kyla will be giving you a little snippet of their research projects as we go through the content today. So we'll cover a lot of ground. It'll be fairly superficial, but um, really I wanna focus on resources and education to share. We just had an anniversary in, uh, in Canada last October was the five-year anniversary of legalization. So I wanted to take a, 
a look back and and at some of the goals of that uh, legislation and and see how we're doing on that front. Talk a little bit about opioid and naloxone resources, and that's where Ashley will come in to talk about her research, and also take a look forward um, to to thinking about emerging psychedelics such as psilocybin as they become more widely used as medicines. And that's where Kyla will come in and talk about her research on how uh, individuals may be self-medicating with psilocybin for obsessive compulsive disorder. And all along sharing resources, we've got links at the end um, and so that you can, you can find all the resources that we'll be talking about. So at the School of Pharmacy, we have a cannabis resources page where you can find all sorts of information about general information about cannabis, cannabis use in, in specific populations, such as in pregnancy or in youth. We've got um, PDFs, uh, YouTube videos, animated YouTube videos. Some are specific to certain types of cannabis products like edibles, a whole cannabis for youth section. Uh, we even have translated resources, and we made these in collaboration with a hospital in Toronto that served uh, a, a percentage of their of their clients and patients spoke Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, and Tamil, and we've translated some of our resource resources into those languages as well. So, if you go back to to twenty seventeen, I guess, or earlier, when cannabis legalization really started to be discussed. Um, you can find that there was actually four to five goals of cannabis uh, legalization. One was to prevent cannabis use in youth. One was to regulate product quality. Two were related to the, the criminal drug trafficking aspect. So, so move cannabis profits from the unregulated criminal market to the regulated market but maintain ongoing penalties for illegal cannabis sales and to try to improve public health and safety with respect to cannabis. And so how did we do if we were gonna get a grade on these goals in the last five years? Well, the first one was preventing cannabis use in youth. This data here is from collected by Stats Canada uh, 2021 to 2022. And what they're looking at is, have you used cannabis in the past 12 months? And if you look at some of the youth demographics, uh, the sort of older teen period or uh, age group of 16 to 19 years, about a third of, of those young people report past 12 month cannabis use. And if you go into the uh, young adult, younger adult demographic, 20 to 24 years, we're actually at about 50% reporting past year use. So the bad news is that legalization really hasn't moved these numbers down um, in that we still have a large portion of, can of youth using cannabis products. I guess if you're more optimistic, what you, can, what you can see is that cannabis legalization hasn't particularly moved these numbers up uh, much. Most of the increases we've seen in cannabis youth have actually come in that 25 year and older age group. So adults adults, and, and even older adults have increased their use of cannabis, not so much the youth. And that's really because they were using cannabis already pre-legalization at fairly high levels. So I think, you know, you can maybe, you can't really grade that one very positively or negatively. If you look at uh, the other stated goal was regulating product quality. Here, I think you can you can look back at cannabis legalization as being successful. Um, major you know, major cannabis producers, uh, medical or recreational, uh, by law need a dedicated quality assurance, quality control uh, manager. Um, if you go into a cannabis store or or look online for a cannabis product, you've got very sort of pharmaceutical looking uh, products that are well-regulated, well-labeled, um, uh, and, and there's a high level of quality control. So in that sense, legalization has, uh, has been successful. The other two goals were related to criminality, um, preventing criminal profits. Uh, that's an area where legalization has 
been successful as well. We've got the majority of Canadians purchasing regulated cannabis products. You'll see numbers upwards, even as high as 85%. Um, prior to legalization, the, 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 the ways that people obtain cannabis uh, were growing it yourself, purchasing it from drug dealers or drug traffickers, or unregulated online sales of cannabis products. And post-legalization, we still have drug, some level of drug trafficking in cannabis, although it's significantly reduced. We still have unregulated stores, so shops that aren't following the rules but are selling cannabis. And we, have, we still have unregulated online sources. But the primary sources for cannabis now are the regulated brick and mortar cannabis shops and the regulated online stores with a few unregulated online sources uh, still persisting. And the last uh, goal was to improve public health and safety. And here we have a mixed bag as well. So we have uh, a higher awareness of impaired driving with cannabis. Unfortunately, the demographic that's still most likely to, to use cannabis and drive is the younger um, under 25 or under 19 group. Um, we have a much, much more awareness of the risks of cannabis use in, in pregnancy and, and are doing a fairly good job on education on that front. We have an awareness of potential drug interactions between uh, either medical or recreational cannabis and uh, and prescription drugs that individuals may be taking and a better and better understanding of when to watch out for some of those drug interactions and when to be less concerned. One area that you may have seen in the news recently was talking about pediatric cannabis poisoning. So typically this would involve young children uh, obtaining or, or taking um, uh, attractive looking cannabis edibles like gummies or chocolates uh, and ingesting them as they would any candy. But of course, they're now ingesting um, uh, a cannabis containing product and that, depending on the dose consumed, can be uh, either serious or, or an emergency situation. Um, we do, we saw this trend actually start to rise prior to legalization as cannabis became less stigmatized and, and a little more um, widely used. And, and legalization, unfortunately, hasn't stopped this trend. And I think in the last few years, the rates have been higher than, than ever. Um, there's one, one silver lining in this is that, uh, by law, the, the THC content of a cannabis edible is maximum 10 milligrams of THC. Whereas if you're buying a cannabis edible from an unregulated online source, um, you can have, um, you can buy products with, with hundreds of milligrams of THC. And so certainly a, a 10 milligram THC accidental cannabis poisoning in, in a child is serious, uh, less, uh, but certainly less so than, than exposure to an unregulated product with very high THC levels. We actually have an infographic for uh, uh, for folks that may have a young child in the, in the house um, called OOPS, which is an acronym for using cannabis outside, using cannabis out of sight, especially edible forms, proper disposal of unused cannabis products, and secure storage, uh, especially of those attractive uh, edibles like gummies and chocolates if small children are around. So next I wanna to turn to another resource page that we have at the School of Pharmacy, um, our naloxone and opioid resources page. Ashley has been involved in the creation of a lot of these. Um, we've got lots of one pagers um, focused, on, focused on pharmacists, but, but also other healthcare professionals as well about normalizing naloxone dispensing in a pharmacy or distribution through, another, through other means, uh, tips for training uh, others on how to use naloxone, frequently asked questions about naloxone, um, naloxone training sort of checklists if you're if you're teaching someone how to use uh, either injectable or uh, intranasal naloxone, and all sorts of one page FAQs that you can print print off and and read yourself or or provide to 
people that are asking you questions about naloxone. We also have lots of videos. Um, these are uh, these are sort of ask a pharmacist videos about comfort level and dispensing naloxone in practice. This isn't on the pharmacy website, but it's another resource that both myself and an, actually another research chair, uh, Professor Fen Chang uh, at Gateway helped to put together. It's a project called Opioid Use and Opioid Use Disorder Education uh, Resources. This is a large project designed for undergraduate pharmacy, nursing, and social work students. So it's interprofessional in nature. And because it's because of that interprofessional nature, actually, I think it's quite accessible, not just to uh, students in these programs, but but to practitioners and even to the general public uh, to go through these modules. There's it's all free. Uh, the the link is is in at the end of the slide show. There's eight modules with sixty five topics that are each about three pages long, um, that cover all aspects of opioid use. The, the st statistics on opioid use, resources, screening assessment, intervention, follow-up, developing uh, trusting therapeutic relationships, the role of, of trauma and violence and cultural safety in and how that affects opioid use and opioid use disorder, uh, how to educate people about opioids, and then pain management and harm reduction. And here I'm going to actually pass things over to Ashley, who's going to talk about her research at the School of Pharmacy related to naloxone dispensing and, and other things. Ashley? Great. Thanks, Oops. Mike. Um, so we can actually go to the next slide. That's just the uh, title about our scoping review that we uh, published and researched. So the whole point of doing that scoping review about uh, pharmacy-based naloxone programs was to kind of understand, you know, the scope of what makes a good um, naloxone training program, um, naloxone availability throughout North America, um, different facilitators and barriers that one would look at to try and optimize naloxone dispensing. And so um, when we're talking about optimizing naloxone dispensing, uh, naloxone itself was uh, made publicly available without a prescription uh, from Ontario pharmacies in 2016. And what we discovered from the scoping review is that few pharmacists ever proactively offer or dispense naloxone, despite the fact that they carry it or they stock it in their pharmacy. Um, there is actually a very big disparity, disparity in naloxone access in rural pharmacies and also particularly independent pharmacies versus chain pharmacies as they are less likely to stock and dispense naloxone uh, compared to uh, urban located pharmacies um, or chain pharmacies like Shoppers Drug Mart or Rexall. Um, and one of the top barriers we found in the scoping review was uh, the dispro disproportionate access uh, was stigma. So stigma was a huge barrier in preventing pharmacists from offering naloxone, but also patients in feeling like they could ask uh, a healthcare professional, either their, um, a prescriber or a pharmacist for naloxone itself. Um, and so because of this, we decided to create a naloxone program that kind of addresses all of the barriers and facilitators that we discovered in the scoping review, and we called it the Optimizing Naloxone Dispensing and Pharmacies Program. And so with this program, we launched it as a randomized controlled trial, and this was accessible to uh, pharmacy professionals, both uh, pharmacy technicians and pharmacists across Canada, and it was trying to get them to increase their knowledge and confidence to proactively offer naloxone without getting uh, patients to ask them for it, while also trying to address stigma. Um, it included practical examples, uh, solutions for common things like how to start a conversation about naloxone, it included a lot of those resources that um, Mike showed earlier uh, through the videos, the infographics, and also included some behavior change techniques, including uh, reflection and goal setting exercises to try and motivate them to uh, sustainably make this behavior change. 
Um, as I mentioned, we implemented it as a randomized control trial, and we found that uh, the participants who uh, were enrolled, they showed a significant increase in their knowledge after completing this program, um, as well as uh, proactive naloxone dispensing, so a significant increase in naloxone distribution at the three-month follow-up, so three months after completing this program, which was great to see. Um, despite there being no statistically significant change in stigma or confidence, it was actually found that um, participants going into this program, they reported high levels of confidence already. So we didn't see any sort of increase in confidence due to the program itself. Um, but it was nice to see that the program itself did significantly increase naloxone dispensing uh, compared to the control group. Um, in general, just talking about if you're thinking about proactively offering naloxone in your practice, um, it's good to know that patients generally uh, will not ask you for naloxone due to stigma or feeling like they're going to be judged um, for asking for it. Um, so research actually shows from the scoping review that patients generally would not be upset by a healthcare professional offering them naloxone and offering to provide education. So therefore, it's a great idea for healthcare professionals to adopt the practice to proactively offer naloxone to help increase optimal distribution, especially in rural practices where um, if someone is suffering from an opioid overdose, they may not have um, appropriate access to healthcare, like in a hospital, to be able to get that emergency access they need. And so uh, it may also be a great idea for uh, prescribing healthcare professionals to write um, that naloxone should be offered on prescriptions as well to help remind um, pharmacists. Um, and generally, uh, due to the naloxone consensus guidelines that were recently published, the general idea or the general recommendation is that everyone taking an opioid, um, whether it's prescribed or not, um, should be generally offered naloxone. Great. Thanks uh, so much, Ashley. Um, and if you have questions for Ashley, all three of us will be uh, available at the end for questions. I know we're moving fast, but the last topic I wanted to talk about was looking forward um, at emerging psychedelics. So psychedelics, the term psychedelic um, is, is defined as sort of mind opening or, or, or something like that. Traditionally, psychedelics have, have been uh, illegal recreational drugs, um, things like LSD in the 60s and psilocybin. Uh, MDMA, which which is also called ecstasy, started to be used in the in the eighties and and as as a party drug since then. Um, but in the past ten or fifteen years, there's been a lot of interest in repurposing these recreational drugs uh, as medicines. And I'll mention two, and then Kyla will talk a little bit about her research. The first is MDMA. So MDMA is a is ecstasy. It's a stimulant similar to amphetamine. Um, it can increase feelings of connectedness between people. And if you look at the phase one and two and three clinical trials, there's lots of interest in using MDMA for lots of reasons. But if you look at the PTSD line, we have, and this is even this table is even a bit outdated, we have lots of ongoing clinical trials with MDMA specifically for post-traumatic stress disorder. The other uh, psychedelic that's being widely studied for use as a medicine is psilocybin. And here you can see an even wider number of potential uses uh, as treatment for addiction or eating disorder, uh, treatments for headache, uh, treatments for anxiety disorders of various types, um, as well as uh, depression. And it's not on this table, but there was recently a, a a phase three clinical trial completed with psilocybin for depression. These drugs are interesting in a couple of ways. Um, they they aren't like your typical prescription drug. So if you if you have anxiety or, or depression, you might go to a, a prescriber and then go to a pharmacy and pick up an antidepressant. And you'll take that antidepressant uh, once or twice a day. Um, hopefully it'll work for your condition, but you'll take it every day for, for months, years even. Um, and, and if you stop taking it, there's, there's a risk that your symptoms may return. 
Um, MDMA and, and psilocybin are, are a little bit different in that they're typically dosed in controlled settings with another person present. Often it's uh, some type of therapist. And the effectiveness of these drugs lasts longer than the drug being in your system. So if if you successfully treat yourself with psilocybin for depression, for example, you, you walk out and you have a, a lasting antidepressant effect that can last for weeks or months before you might need to, to take another dose. What we saw with cannabis prior to legalization is that it became less stigmatized. And so even if, if it wasn't legal, people were starting to use it more and more. And I think in the next few years, as psychedelics become more clinically accepted as medicines and less stigma, stigmatized, people may try to use these drugs recreationally or for self-medication. And the image on the screen here is a dispensary. We're seeing these pop up in a lot of major urban centers. So Toronto was the first. This one is actually in Cambridge. Um, so sort of advocates of psilocybin containing mushrooms or so-called magic mushrooms, uh, really challenging the regulatory status of, of psilocybin and, and opening dispensaries to sell to the public. And there's various, this one was shut down at least once, maybe twice now by Waterloo Region Police Services. Um, but certainly there's a growing and growing um, uh, acceptance that these drugs might be just more than recreational. And here I'll toss it over to Kyla to talk about her project about psilocybin and OCD. Thank you, Dr. Weasley. Hi, everyone. I'm Kyla. I conducted a research project while I was a student at the School of Pharmacy. So I worked under Dr. Weasley, and it was regarding psilocybin for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms. And we were specifically looking at user-generated online content. So for those who aren't too familiar with OCD, it's a chronic disabling condition. And unfortunately, up to 40% of people don't respond to the therapies that we have right now. A lot of the therapies are antidepressants and psychotherapy. And as of January 2022, Health Canada allowed, um, there was an exemption under the CDSA for the application to obtain both MDMA and psilocybin. And these requests are put through the special access program. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with the special access program while during 2022, so when it was very new to them. And just like every other request that passes through the program, it's reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So not necessarily like automatically, yes. Um, in terms of our objectives, we wanted to see if psilocybin has the potential to be used as pharmacotherapy for OCD. Unfortunately, there, because of its status for like, its longstanding status of being an illicit substance, there wasn't a lot of funding or research being done um, in terms of like clinical trials specifically. So a lot of the research we were looking at was actually in just user experiences for people who were posting online in different forums. So we were looking specifically through gray literature. So I looked through Reddit, bluelight.org, which is, they're both forums where people can post anonymously about their experiences. And then I also did the same search in Google and tr went through all of the Google results, also looking for different types of forums or people who might've had like a webpage describing their experiences for specifically psilocybin with OCD. And I ran the search from all time until August 20th, 2022. And we were looking for posts that did talk about, um, so both psilocybin and OCD. We're also looking for posts with dose included. And then we also put the post through a software called Monkey Learn. And Monkey Learn is a software that can, it can do a bunch of different things, but we were specifically looking at sentiment. So essentially you put the, the text through the software and it pulls out different words like happy or sad, and it attributes a sentiment to the post. So um, a positive, neutral, or negative sentiment. And so overall, uh, after running the search strategy through the different platforms, I was able to extract from 22 different posts. So on the, on the left, the most common dosage form was unprocessed mushrooms. So if you were to read a study, you might see doses in like the milligram, like very low milligrams, 10 to 25. Those are more synthetic forms of psilocybin. Um, most people, because it's not readily available, they buy from people who grow mushrooms and dry them out at their, at their home. Um, so a lot of the mushrooms that people were taking in the post were just like dry, dried raw mushrooms. And in order to get some kind of effect, you'd have to take much higher doses. 
the common co-therapies people were using were uh, psychotherapy. So one specific type of therapy that people use for OCD is called exposure response prevention. And then antidepressants. So there are various types, SSRIs and SNRIs. And then common conditions that patients had were anxiety and depression. Um, OCD is an extension of an anxiety depression and the symptoms are very debilitating. So it can cause depression. So that's common to see. In terms of the dose, this was something we wanted to look at because there isn't really a standardized dose um, and then attributable side effects to that either. There isn't really a, any kind of resource that we can use. I was using ICERS, which is an ethnobotanical research group, and they had their own classification and we're classifying in the grams. So we're classifying doses of raw unprocessed mushrooms here. So you can see a lot of people were using uh, microdose, which is under 0.25 grams, low dose, uh, average doses and high doses, average doses being the most common, um, but there's quite an array of doses that people were using. And our key findings of the work. So what was interesting to read was a lot of people, despite this being not readily available, were very persistent in continuing to purchase mushrooms or attain them somehow and continue dosing them to find a regimen that worked for them. So we were seeing various regimens. Um, some people were dosing like every other day or every day during the week and taking breaks on the weekends. So there were very uh, different regimens that were presented. Um, but still, people were very persistent because they saw the benefits of using the therapies. And then what was even more interesting was a lot of people, as we had mentioned before, were able to have benefits and lasting benefits up to months with just one dose or micro doses of psilocybin. So it's nice to see that because a lot of the current therapies, even psychotherapy, it's on a continual basis. Um, it can obviously have a lot of negative consequences. So for example, cost being one of them, but also exposing yourself to the adverse effects a lot more often because you'd be taking it more. But with one dose and micro doses, that kind of alleviates some of the consequences such as adverse effects. Um, adverse effects weren't always reported, but everyone was able to manage any of the adverse effects that they felt uh, as they described in their experience. One of the adverse effects that we're always worried about is a bad trip. So a bad trip is where you may have a recollection of a past trauma or a bad experience um, because it really brings to light a lot of your own personal experiences while you are under the effects of psilocybin. Um, but everyone that was able to take psilocybin and, um, or sorry, everyone that had a bad trip was able to recover within the post, as described in the post. And then when comparing uh, psilocybin to what we have available for OCD right now, there, again, isn't a lot of research. We anticipate and we see a lot of research coming out. So that'll be interesting to see um, what kind of conclusions they come up with. But right now we know a lot about psilocybin as like monotherapy or as its own therapy, but we don't have a lot of evidence with regards to uh, different interactions. So that would be important because a lot of patients are already on therapies or have different conditions and are trying to dose psilocybin on top of that. So we don't have a lot of information on like food and drug interactions, uh, drug drug interactions and conditions. So for example, um, having a history of psychosis, would psilocybin be safe with that? And then if psilocybin were to become readily available, uh, we would likely see it in urban areas as we already do see it now. So living in Ottawa here, we do have a few stores that are open, but they're all in like the downtown center town area. So it would take a little bit of time before we start seeing it in rural areas. And also if it does become a lot more used, we may also have most of the therapy because you do need like a, a medically trained psychotherapist. Uh, a lot of the therapies may not be like broadly available. They'll be in more central hospitals where they can be monitored. Um, so patients unable or unwilling to access medical psilocybin may choose to self-medicate as well. So we're seeing that with cannabis. Cannabis stores have people using cannabis for various reasons, not necessarily just to use recreationally. Um, so it's nice to see that the results are promising with regards to how patients can find their own regimens and manage side effects. And overall, our data suggests that psilocybin has the potential to be used as pharmacotherapy for symptoms of OCD. Awesome. Thanks, Kyla. So just a few additional resources to leave you with. Um, uh, Ashley's program, Optimizing the Loxone Dispensing in Pharmacies, is on our uh, Waterloo School of Pharmacy Lifelong Learning page. You can enroll for free. 
Uh, the other, one of the other programs on that page is something that I put together called Substance Use in Primary and Community Care that really covers essentially everything except cannabis and, um, and opioids because we have that opioid resource, um, that interprofessional opioid resource, and we're soon to launch a, a cannabis short course on this platform as well. So here are all the links. We can share those um, via Gateway as well to the cannabis resource page at the School of Pharmacy, the naloxone resource page, the interprofessional opioid resources, and the two courses that I just mentioned. Uh, we'll have a Q&A se session now uh, until the end of the hour. Um, but there's, if you have additional questions or queries, please feel free to email me direct, uh, mbaisley at ewaterloo.ca. We're also creating a email via gateway um, for, uh, especially for regional healthcare practitioners or service providers, if you have specific questions that we don't get to today at substance-info uh, at gateway.ca. So thank you very much for your attention. I know we threw a lot at you across three different drugs and, and so it was very fast. So we'll take some time now to go through some questions. Um, so the first question is the Waterloo School of Pharmacy developing explanatory resources right now concerning psychedelics as they have done for cannabis and opioids? The answer is yes. Um, I don't know if we'll, when we'll have our, our, our own page. Um, I think one of the themes, and I've been working in this area for several years now, and one of the um, challenges in the area of substance use education harm reduction treatment is that it's been very reactive. And so the, in hindsight, we should have seen the opioid crisis coming and some people did, um, but there was, there was a lot of reactive responses to the opioid crisis. And by the time you've got a crisis, it's hard to, to do much prevention. In a similar way, cannabis legalization happened fairly quickly um, and so there was a big learning curve. And with psychedelics, I think they're going through clinical trials like other prescription drugs, which, which is good because it means they're very robustly studied. Um, it's the, the downside is it's slow. So for, for advocates, they're, it's frustrating because they want access to these substances sooner. But that slow, steady process also allows us to get out ahead of of things like this and, and to really educate practitioners and the public about psychedelics and how they're used clinically and how people might use them recreationally or for self-medication. Um, uh, the next question is, any emerging research regarding psilocybin and ALS that you are aware of? Um, I'm not aware of any specifically. Kyla, do you have, have come across this? I have not, no. Yeah. What we see with cannabis and what we will see with psilocybin is you'll have two lists of conditions that the drug can be used for. You'll have the sort of official list where the evidence is the best um, for cannabis that is uh, uh, nerve pain, some types of chronic pain, cancer pain, um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis, nausea and vomiting if you're undergoing chemotherapy. So there's the short list where you've got pretty good evidence. And then there's the long list where you've got hints of evidence. And for cannabis, that's a really long list. And for psilocybin and MDMA, I think what you'll see is the same thing. Psilocybin, I think the best evidence that will come out for that will be for depression and maybe some anxiety disorders, maybe a treatment of addiction. Uh, for MDMA, it'll be PTSD. But as that's happening and those main ones get a lot of research, there'll be other areas where emerging areas. But I can look into that uh, for you after the talk. Um, Brian has a question. CCPA and NFU have done some research on the farmer mental health crisis. It appears that you are supporting their findings that rural settings are a place for physical and mental health dangers exceeding urban settings you have described some of the barriers. What are the solutions? That's a big question. I, I don't know if I don't I don't have the uh, the knowledge to compare urban and rural settings 
with respect to the extent uh, of mental health um, dangers. I, certainly there's di similarities and differences between the two settings. The barriers will be um, similar to what we've discussed. And so initially, I think you'll see, for example, maybe psilocybin clinics pop up that, that are sort of designed to administer the drug in a controlled setting with some sort of therapist or other healthcare practitioner. Just because of numbers, those will tend to be in the, um, in probably larger centers. Um, and hopefully as, uh, as we learn more about how to administer these drugs successfully, who to administer them to, what red flags to look out for, that we can then um, move some of that practice into, into less well-served jurisdictions. Kyla, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, you know, how psilocybin might roll out once it becomes a prescription drug? Yeah, I think we were suggesting it to be similar to cannabis. Um, because there's a lot more, like in terms of just po population density and where people are, there's a lot more people in urban settings. In Vancouver, they have a they have progressed a lot more than other parts of Canada with regards to psilocybin therapy, and we're seeing it in a lot of their major hospitals. Um, because of all the unknowns, I think we want them to be closer to medical help, uh, emergency help. So it would be likely starting in the more urban settings. Um, but then once it becomes a bit more well known, or not necessarily well known, but well studied, and we can gauge the effects, and then maybe we can start um, having a broader access. Uh, yeah, but it's rollout's probably going to be similar to cannabis in that sense. Yeah, I agree. Um, have there been any initiatives to translate opioid resources and tools to Ojibwe? Um, no, but I would love to. Um, we are partnering with the Northern um, School of Medicine, NOSM, and others, um, and I would really like to translate some of these resources into, we've, we've got many of them translated into French. You saw some of the other languages, um, and I would, I'm always looking for partners to try to translate these. Um, I'm trying to learn Ojibwe myself via a phone app. I'm not very good at languages, so it's going very, very slowly, but, but I'd love to. Um, to try to do that. Uh, are there any uh, pharmacy doing any active research on scopolamine to treat psychiatric disorders? Uh, not, I'm not, and not that I, um, not that I know of. Um, Ashley or Kyla, do you have any? Have you come across scopolamine in any of your research? Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, I once read an article on the other victims of the opioid crisis. It was about people in pain who were denied effective pain relief because of other people that misuse uh, the painkillers like opioids. A uh, family member has cancer and is on hydromorphone, which has side effects. More could be done about both alternative pain relief measures and better use of pharmaceuticals. What is new in the pain relief encountering side effects as well as destigmatizing those who deserve good pain control. This is a big question. This is a question that uh, that spans decades. Um, prior and and I'll and I'll tell tell you a little bit what I'm about what I mean. So once um, pr prior to around the late '90s, uh, opioids were very restricted and their use was considered very dangerous. They were considered very addictive. And, and so uh, they, were, they were very hard to get. People were very prudent about doses. When I was in pharmacy school around that time, there started to be a shift in, um, in attitudes. Um, and, and that was led in part by people experiencing chronic pain that were saying, listen, like, I'm experiencing chronic pain. You don't have anything else to give me and you're not giving me opioids or enough opioids. And so there was a call for more access. And at the same time, there was a shift 
a sort of re-examining of how dangerous opioids are. And there was an article, it was a letter to the editor, New England Journal of Medicine by a by someone who prescribed opioids that said, you know, we're overestimating the risks here. And, and that's having the consequence of preventing good pain control. And lo and behold, right around that same time, uh, a company called Purdue Pharma, which by the way, isn't related to Purdue University. Uh, their communications persons must have been living a nightmare the past 10 years sharing the sharing the name, but Purdue Pharma came out with um, with OxyContin, which was a sustained release oxycodone preparation. And the benefits of that were to be, you don't have to take opioids multiple times a day. You can take it once a day. Uh, it's much safer. It's more effective. And some of that was true. It just turned out that you could crush OxyContin and get all the oxycodone at once. And, and there was a real pendulum swing from opioids are really dangerous uh, and we're not treating chronic pain to opioids are aren't that dangerous. We have these new dosage forms. And that was actually the, the, the generation of what we're currently experiencing in the opioid crisis. And so these pendulums swing back and forth. And in an ideal world, we on a case by case basis would be treating pain effectively with opioids or other uh, or other agents, and at the same time preventing uh, opioid misuse. So it's a big question, and it's a really difficult question. And I've hope I've given you just a little bit of um, a little bit of information on that. Uh, Michelle asks, do you have a sense of rural family doctors uh, and how familiar they are with these topics? Should it be prompted? Could it be made available? Um, generally, I think, um, and maybe I'll let you speak to this, Kyla, but um, some of the emerging psychedelics are fairly niche, and I, I don't know how widely um, familiar uh, general practitioners, doctors, and nurses, and pharmacists are, unless they, they're sort of interested specifically in that. But I don't know if I have any data. Kyla? Yeah, I haven't um, even, well, even here, like within the hospitals here that I work at, because we don't use them and we don't try to access them for our patients, we don't really study them or look into how they work. Um, not to say that we're not aware that they are emerging. Sometimes you do have patients who ask, but we don't necessarily work for that because we're not hospitals built for the those types of therapies. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Perhaps if there's more literature than rural family doctors or all doctors might want to learn a little bit about it as patients become curious, which is kind of like that for any new emerging drugs. Like mm -hmm. once you start seeing them more, then they have to kind of brush up on how they work and if they'll be effective for all their, their patients too. Yeah. Um, and Brian has a, a follow-up comment on his, uh, uh, some of those rural versus, um, urban mental health challenges and and another comment from public health talking about the use of accident um with respect to cannabis poisonings yes so so we're not using the word accident accidental uh, poisoning so unintentional you'll see different words used um so i think that's all of the questions we've got from the q a oh there's a maybe a couple in the chat um nope those are just a, about a survey. Um, so we're happy to answer any last questions. Um, Ashley, did you have any parting comments? Oh, Jay's got a question first. Hi, Jay. Yeah, yeah. I actually have a question. I, I would like to know, uh, psilocybin in particular and, and controlled substances, I know um, there are other countries where the legislation might make it easier to research psychedelics or uh, um, controlled substances. And I'm wondering, how does Canada rank in, in the terms of the world, uh, the world research um, potential, uh, how does Canada rank in terms of um, where where we are in the world for researching these these substances? Um, I think we rank quite quite highly, actually. Um, a lot of the the current psychedelic research was spearheaded by a group called MAPS, which is the uh, multidisciplinary association for psychedelic research. I believe is the acronym. Uh, they're started in the U.S., but they have collaborators in Canada. Um, 
And as I alluded to earlier, one of the best things that MAPS did was not to provocatively open psilocybin dispensaries on, you know, um, and that sort of thing. They they really took of a slow and measured uh, approach of moving some of these drugs through the traditional clinical trial process that you know, cholesterol drugs and blood pressure drugs have to go through. So by doing that, um, they really, the robustness of their, of the conclusions by that group and others, um, I think will be unlike cannabis where you really had medical cannabis become available with, with actually very relatively little research. Um, I think by the time psilocybin becomes a regulated prescription drug, we'll have a much better specific idea, at least with a few conditions of, of how it should be used and who should uh, be shoot, who it should be used in. And things like, uh, you know, there, these things will come hopefully with some guidance. Like if you failed a clinical trial with two established therapies, maybe you're eligible to try psilocybin, for example. And I think that's how it will roll out. So it's slow and steady. It's frustratingly slow for some advocates, um, especially some of the people uh, that Kyla was researching where they're self-medicating and they're posting, you know, this, this worked, nothing else worked and this worked. Why can't this be, you know, why can't I get this now? Um, and, but MAPS and others are really doing a slow and steady process on that. Um, Brian asks, how quickly would research done in other countries become acceptable practice here? Um, these days it's, it's quite fairly rapidly. So, so, so research is able to be translated quite quickly from, from other countries. There's an anonymous uh, comment about a New York times article on big corporations like Compass jousting over the profits and making some rather unusual patent claims. Yeah, so um, one of the challenges for cannabis as well as psilocybin and MDMA is that they're all old drugs or natural products. So they're not patentable and that slows down the product process because for better or worse, pharma companies spend billions of dollars on patented drugs in clinical trials so they can make billions of dollars once they hit the market and that big money isn't is sort of taken out of the game when you have uh, natural products or not patentable uh, chemicals like MDMA. Uh, Ashley, do you have any final comments before we wrap up? Um, I'll maybe add a little bit to the, to the one question that they were asking about, um, the patients who are affected to the opioid crisis and not having proper access to sometimes appropriate treatments. And so, um, I, I don't know if everyone's aware, but the new opioid, um, chronic pain guidelines are going to be released soon. And so those really highlight, um, not drastically um, tapering and stopping opioid prescriptions. So it's a lot about education and uh, making sure that prescribers and as well as pharmacists um, know not to rapidly taper um, opioid prescriptions, but make sure that um, they also have proper access as well. And so a lot of it is uh, working with the patient and a lot of shared decision making. Um, yesterday, I launched a research program that kind of builds off of this as well. And so um, in this research program, uh, pharmacists will be uh, collaborating with prescribers and they'll be able to uh, conduct chronic pain and opioid uh, medication reviews in pharmacies to try and support uh, prescribers with assessing um, appropriate opioid use and, and treating chronic pain appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And maybe Kyla, to finish uh, off the session, um, Angela asked, do you see psychedelics as being a harm reduction tool for rural areas? And that's an interesting question because as we mentioned, you can take one dose and then have lasting effects. And I feel like for people who may be coming from afar and who might not have access to the therapies that need very close monitoring, um, this would be an excellent option for them. 
which is why sometimes we actually don't use our typical standard therapies and go for other therapies uh, for other types of conditions. So um, in terms of harm reduction for what, uh, like we're looking at like opioid and different types of substance use where it can be helpful. Um, but in terms of a treatment option, yeah, I think it would have a lot of benefit for people coming from afar from rural areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, thanks everyone for your attention. And Jay, I'll pass it on to you to finish us up. Great. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And of course, if you had questions uh, for, for the panel that didn't get answered today, uh, substance-info at gatewayruralhealth.ca is your best, best way to get the uh, uh, questions answered. So as we conclude this lecture, we really hope this was um, educational, useful for our, our understanding on substance use in the rural care setting. The resources that Dr. Beasley mentioned will be on the Gateway website after the lecture. There's also a link to a form in the uh, chat box here. If you're an attendee watching, uh, please take a moment to fill out that form. It's going to help us out with uh, tailoring the Gateway Rural Health Lecture Series to things that the viewers want to see. So please take a moment to fill that out if you can. Um, it is through this lecture series that Gateway strives to better the health and well-being of rural residents through research, education, and communication uh, by providing the range of topics relevant to our rural communities. Huge thank you to Dr. Beasley, Ashley, Kyla. Thank you both uh, for, for being on the panel today. Uh, we would like to also thank our sponsors for our their, their continued support. Without them, the lecture series would not be possible. These include Microage Basics in Godrich, McGee Motors in Godrich, Libro Credit Union, Lighthouse Money Management in Godrich, McEwen and Fagan Insurance Brokers in Godrich, Huron Telecommunications, Zayers Godrich, CIBC Wealth Management, and the Godrich Royal Canadian Legion Branch 109. Uh, Gateway is a not-for-profit organization with charitable status, and we greatly appreciate all the support we, we receive. If you would like to make a donation, uh, swing on over to gatewayruralhealth.ca forward slash donate. And we can uh, help help to keep this lecture series and other health projects going. You can also find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, and um, and and X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, our next lecture is on Tuesday, February sixth, uh, at noon, where we will learn about enhancing emergency medicine in rural Northern Ontario, learning from COVID nineteen. The keynote speaker for that one is Amanda Manjan, a PhD candidate at University of Guelph, who lives and works in Temiskaming Shores. So excited to hear about that one. Anyways, thank you all for joining us and um, we'll see you next month. Sounds good. Thanks, Jake. Thanks all.